That's the program schedule here on C-SPAN 2. Now we take you to Los Angeles for the speech by Wallace D. Muhammad, Muslim American spokesman for human salvation. He recently addressed a gathering of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and shared his views on how Muslims contribute to world peace. Mr. Muhammad is the son of the late Elijah Muhammad, former leader of the Nation of Islam. My name is Curtis Mack, President of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council, and we're so pleased to have you all with us today. We're also very pleased to have with us a nationwide cable television audience with uh, our good friends at C-SPAN providing the coverage for us today. I'd like to acknowledge the Consul General of Saudi Arabia, Ambassador Hassan Nasir, who is with us today representing the Concert Corps of Los Angeles. Ambassador Nasir, thank you for being with us. And to remind you also of a couple of programs upcoming right after the new year. Catholicos Karakin II, the Catholicos of uh, the Great House of Cilicia, the Armenian Apostolic Church, will be with us in early January. And Peter Arnett, the CNN correspondent who spent so much of his time overseas uh, during his lifetime, will be with us later in January. And his topic is live from the battlefield. At this point in time, it is my pleasure to introduce to you a member of the Board of Directors of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council who will be serving as our chairman for today, a lady who is involved in so many things in Los Angeles, an author, a, a lawyer, a lady who has her own television program, just someone who's involved in so many things. It's my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce to you Ms., uh, Mrs. Guilford Glazer, Diane Glazer. Thank you, Curtis. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, and it's so good to see you. You are a very warm crowd, and you know all about Islam. You know that Islam is one of the world's greatest religions. It flourishes as one of the primary guiding forces in contemporary life for its adherents all around the world. Obviously, a force of great fervor and great conviction well beyond our shores, Islam also counts millions of Americans among its devoted followers. In fact, a milestone was set just last Friday with regard to American Islam. Representing recent changes in troop demographics, the United States Armed Forces installed its first Islamic chaplain. So, not only in the Middle East, but around the world, Islam is increasingly a potent force. The powerful political language of Islam carries challenges which often confound many policymakers in Western democracies. But we must remind ourselves that acts perpetrated by so-called extremists do not and of themselves characterize the agenda of all followers of Islam. The words of our guest this afternoon will surely speak for themselves. Imam Wallace D. Muhammad is one of the leading Islamic figures in the United States. Born in 1933, the fifth son of the founder of the Nation of Islam, the late Elijah Muhammad, our guest was raised amidst the tenets of, the traditional, of traditional Islam. A course of rigorous study and vibrant intellectual curiosity, however, spurred the young Wallace Muhammad to question the faith before him. As a result of his open questioning of the validity of the Nation of Islam's theology, the young Wallace Muhammad was twice excommunicated. Nevertheless, and perhaps strengthened by his vigorous examination of the religious doctrines. In 1975, the day after his father, Elijah Muhammad's passing, Wallace Muhammad, at age 42, inherited the mantle of his father's leadership and became imam. Intent 
on spreading the message of the Islamic faith and the teaching of the Quran to bring dignity and stability to his followers. Imam Muhammad makes an outgoing contribution toward building respect, to respect for Islamic life in America and for American Africans or African Americans. His message promotes striving for individual excellency and working towards tolerance. Imam Muhammad's guidance has helped to establish mosques and schools in every major American city as well as in Canada and in the Caribbean. In addition, he works actively to establish direct and meaningful dialogue between Muslims, Christians, and Jews. Representing Muslims in America, Imam Muhammad has traveled the world, conferred with numerous leaders on the international stage, and participated in a host of Islamic gatherings including two addresses in Saudi Arabia after the Gulf War, where he condemned Islamic Jihad. In the United States, he delivered an historic address at the Pentagon on the fundamentals of the Islamic faith to military chaplains and other personnel in the interest of increased opportunities for Muslim chaplains in the American military. The very next day, on February 6, 1992, he became the first Muslim representative to deliver an invocation on the floor of the United States Senate. The following month, in the state of Georgia, the state of his father's birth, he delivered to a standing ovation of elected officials the first address of a Muslim leader on the floor of the Georgia State Legislature. As part of the inauguration activities for President Clinton, on January 20th, 1993, in Washington, D.C., he was invited to participate as the representative for the religion of Islam in the inaugural interfaith prayer service. His famous and controversial father advocated separate states for blacks and whites before changing times softened his rhetoric. But our guest, Imam reconciliation between the races is possible in America and has won praise for his emphasis on the teachings of brotherhood and unity with all races and religions. I sat next to Imam. I find him to be a most delightful, brilliant man. And we are pleased to host him at our podium today for what promises to be a fascinating discussion of and universal values, how Muslims are to contribute to world peace. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in giving a most warm welcome to Imam Wallace Dean Mohammed. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. In the name of God, we trust God for the results of our efforts, that our efforts be pleasing to him. And we salute with the traditional salute, the last prophet, with the prayers and peace upon him and what follows. <clears throat> it is indeed one of the most special occasions for me during my leadership representing the Muslims of America uh, to have the opportunity to make this address at this luncheon given by the World Affairs Council on this significant day, December the 7th. I'm asked to speak on how Islam can con contrib contribute to world peace. I believe that's a very easy topic for me, and if I would <clears throat> satisfy my own desire, I would speak too long and uh, do a disservice to you at, on this occasion. <laughs> I would speak too long on the very positive and wonderful things that I find in our holy book and in the life of our prophet, prayers and peace beyond him, 
that uh, give us all the encouragement that we need and even more to serve world peace. <clears throat> President J. Curtis Mack, Vice President Miriam Marcus, and the Chair, uh, we uh, would like to say thank you for this very special opportunity. <clears throat> Honorable gathering, um, uh, in which uh, I've uh, uh, been made aware, in this gathering, I've been made aware that the representative of the Royal Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, His Excellency, uh, the Ambassador Nazir, is present here, and this is also a great, makes this occasion very special for us here. <clears throat> Both Christianity and Islam were severely persecuted when introduced into the area of their birth or nativity. Islam survived the first wave of persecution. And a model, a model society for Muslims was established in Medina after wars, persecution, and wars to defend the mission and the Muslims. <clears throat> that model government is remembered by all Muslims, especially by the scholars of Islam, most of the scholars of Islam that I have occasion to know and speak with regarding the character of Islamic society and the character of Islamic rule or government, they all point to the government established by the Prophet as a model for us. That government mandated that Jews would have the right to practice their religion just as they had practiced it before the establishment of the government by the prophet in Medina. Uh, that government was a model government also in that it did not deprive any of the citizens, whether they were Muslims or not, of the right to a good life and a prosperous life. <clears throat> we know that uh, trouble developed later and that good relationship with the Jews of Medina, Medina ended. And I'm not here to explain what uh, happened to cause trouble for the relationship that uh, we all admire and want for ourselves uh, presently with the Jewish people. Um, but I'm only pointing to the attitude that we should have as Muslims, and that is that we should recognize the Jewish faith as a legitimate uh, faith, a legitimate religion, as uh, a religion that has as its founder the prophets, the great prophets, and as the inspiration behind it, the same God that we acknowledge, the God of the heavens and the earth. <clears throat> also, we have Spain, Spain. Not that we like everything that developed in the history of Spain for the Muslims and our relationship with the outer world, or with the other, uh, other world uh, people, that is Christian, Christian and others, but that was what we uh, point to as a, a time for peace and good relationship with Jewish people and also with the Christians for a time. That was lost, but we are happy to point to that time, 300, 400 centuries of peace for the religions, for the two great religions, and I would say for the three great religions. <clears throat> We believe that Islam promotes world peace and that the elements for bringing about faith and guidance in us for peaceful coexistence with other religions and other societies is inherent in Islam. It is believed we are leaving behind us now to be buried forever the religious corruption and savage behavior which we charge to the Crusades, the centuries of conflict for the, what they say symbolically, the crescent and the cross. We hope that we are leaving behind us that poisonous propaganda that came out of uh, that time period and the conflict for the Christian and Muslim uh, communities of the world. 
We believe that this time that we are enjoying now for better relations with Christians and Jews and the intelligent, civilized people of the world is the best time, and I'm quoting a rabbi uh, who was uh, at, uh, introducing himself at a dialogue that we had recently. Uh, he said that this time is the best time ever for the great religions, Muslims, Jews, and Christians. And I add, this is the best time ever for getting together to serve world peace throughout the world. Islam does more than just tolerate religious and cult cultural diversity. Islam promotes in its believers a sound regard for the religions and cultures of the world. Dr. Hamuda El Ati, spelled uh, H A M M U D A H, the last name is spelled A B D U L A T I. In his book, Islam in Focus, writes, and I quote him, under the political system of Islam, every citizen, citizen is entitled to enjoy freedom of thought and expression. But, he cautions, it is not, freedom, pardon me, is not an invitation to chaos and anarchy. Islam promotes private ownership. I am continuing now um, uh, to present what I see as developments for Islam and in Islam that serve to relieve any suspicion that we might have that Islam is not a religion that can make contribution to world peace. Islam promotes private ownership. Islam promotes the rights of all people to compete for shares in all resources, all the natural resources, or in all resources. Islam promotes the development of one's potential to the fullest capacity, or to the fullest extent, according to one's honest judgment. That is, as long as one is well-meaning, the person, the individual is well-meaning, and it's a person of good conscience, a good con conscience, a person of conscience, 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 pardon me, having good intentions, then Islam is to permit that person full freedom to develop in the society as much as that person can develop. And we are to as assist that person, not to just permit the person the freedom, but to give assistance to that person, whether that person be a mu Muslim member of that society, of our society or not. We can be a non-Muslim. We are, we are to give that same right to every citizen, irrespect, irrespect uh, with no respect, pardon me, to their religion, their race, or their nationality. Every citizen is to enjoy with Muslims citizenship, quality citizenship, first class citizenship. A real Muslim society, knowing its religion, would not allow that citizens be treated differently, having some that are not Muslims as second class citizens and reserving first class citizenship only for Muslims. We couldn't accept that and tolerate that in light of what our religion says and its number one authority in the Quran and the second authority for Muslims, the life of the Prophet himself, prayers and peace be on him. What is Islam? I think to tell you at this particular time what the Prophet has told us Islam is also will serve to relieve any fears that this religion is religion that the, the world can welcome and give place to <clears throat> for the purpose of promoting or serving peace in the world. The prophet, when asked the question, he answered, it is to believe in God, to believe in his angels, to believe in revelation, to believe in the prophets, 
uh, the, the, the prophets, uh, that is to believe in prophets and the books that they brought, uh, and to <coughs> uh, believe in life after death, uh, to believe in the judgment day, to believe in the ordinance of God, a law that works throughout the creation to reward and punish depending on the attitude toward creation. This is the belief of Muslims. And if any Muslim would recite the belief of Muslims and would not identify himself as a Muslim, I don't believe any member of the other religions, the great religions, would have any problem with those beliefs. They're the same. The beliefs are the same, essentially the same for us, whether we are Muslim or Christian or some other, or especially the people of the book, the people we call people of the book. Our belief is essentially the same. Where we differ, uh, I believe, uh, is in how we practice that religion, how we practice those beliefs, pardon me, how we practice those beliefs or apply those principles. Uh, so the prophet also said that Islam is to believe in God, uh, Islam is to give in charity, uh, Islam is to pray and make prayers for God, to, uh, to God, uh, wish, give worship to God, and Islam is to fast the month of Ramadan, the ninth month in the Islamic calendar. Uh, and Islam is to visit the house, that is to make hajj or pilgrimage to the house. Now, um, uh, quickly, as, I, as quickly as I can, I would like to say to you that to believe in God for us, to believe in God is also to believe in the unity of matter, the oneness of the system of the universe, and to believe in the unity of man, the oneness of the human family, uh, and so on. This is, comes under the topic or the heading we call Tawheed, oneness or unity in Islam. Uh, and um, to believe in his prophet is to believe that God, that God communicates to man his, his, per, his will and purpose for man on this earth. Uh, to believe in God is also to worship God, to give our whole life in worship to God. That is, Muslims don't consider uh, just the rituals as worship. We consider the service that we render that is useful in society. We consider all the service that we render that is useful to the society, to the Muslim society and to society at large, as worship. Uh, this, this we'll find in the many books that's written by our uh, able scholars in Islam. And uh, worship to us is being of service to mankind. That's worship to, to us, being of good service to mankind. And our religion, our religion, uh, I believe, have so many references to our relationship with people at large or to mankind that it is impossible for us to be selfish in our religion, to work for selfish ends. We must work for the good of the global community. Uh, we are told, first of all, that uh, our worship is the natural worship, the worship that's inherent in all people. And we are told that the house that we turn to as a symbol, giving us a center for our uh, 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 movements and activities, prayer, especially prayer and pilgrimage, that that house was built for all people. God says, Buni Alinnas. It was built for all people. And uh, we are also told uh, by the prophet himself, prayers and peace be on him, that the best of us is the one who best serves people and nas, people, people. <coughs> and God says that we are khaira ummatan ukhrijat lin nas. He says, you are an excellent community, evolved or brought out of darkness, of ignorance, and, and uh, savagery, of corruption, and blindness for what? All people, for all people. So it is, it is impossible for us to know our religion and then not make our life also a service, for the global, a service in the global community and for the benefit and good of the global community. <clears throat> We have no such idea as absolute ownership in Islam. And I think this is another point for Islam, for the Muslim community, that, will, uh, that would, uh, I hope, would make, it make us welcome 
uh, in the society of the world. We do not recognize absolute ownership for any human being, any religion, any person. Absolute ownership is only God, for God. We say the earth belongs to God. We say the people belong to God. We even say that we say the destiny belongs to God. Everything belongs to God. Our ownership is limited, has to be qualified, and our ownership is uh, basically or uh, essentially a trust and not a possession that we have. For we all will live and die, and we leave everything behind us, and none of us can know how our interest is going to be protected when we are dead. We only hope that it will be protected. Everything belongs to God. He is the only absolute owner of the resources and everything, including ourselves. This is how Muslims believe. If God now is the absolute owner of the earth and all of his resources and the destiny for man, then we must accept the right of all people in the benefits and in the resources. Uh, we also say that Muslims have no right in Islam to seek a dominance. And we know that the long period of wars uh, that involved Muslim nations would suggest otherwise to us. We know that the great conquest, conquest for Islam would suggest otherwise for us, to us. But that is not our reference when we are looking for uh, the right behavior or the right position to take. The Quran is our reference. And God says in the Quran that he will never give authority or power or rule to anyone who seeks a dominance, to anyone who seeks a dominance. Females have rights in Islam, and I'm speaking very briefly on these, these, these particular points. There's much to be said. I, I suggest that uh, you who are students are inquiring to know more about Islam, go to a good library and get some of the many books that are written, written in English now by scholars in Islam on uh, the rights of the rights, uh, human rights, the rights of females in Islam. <clears throat> females have rights to equal education, and the Prophet he promoted the, this interest so, uh, in such a great way when he promised that if any man would educate two daughters, and that was at a time when women were looked upon as properties, the property of the men, uh, to be used for the men's pleasure. Their rights weren't respected at all. It was almost a savage, in fact, it was a savage time. The time before the dawning of Islam on the continent, uh, pardon me, on the peninsula of Arabia. <clears throat> the prophet said anyone, any man who would educate two daughters would be given as reward paradise. Women are to compete in business and also in politics or in government. In fact, I don't see any real problem for the rights of women in Islam. Not when the Islam is correctly understood and the knowledge is available. I don't see any real problem for the rights of women. And I don't think that uh, Pakistan would select a woman twice to be the head of the government if there was any serious problem for the rights of women. Uh, the daughter of uh, Bhutto was selected once, and now she has been selected for the second time to be the president of Pakistan. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so I think our fears are not well founded. If we understand this religion of Islam, we will be removed, our pot me will have these, those fears removed from us. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, as normal, we'll take as many questions as we can from the audience. If you have a question and have not written it on a card yet, please do so. Raise your hand and a member of our staff will come by and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, Imam Muhammad, the first question is, in the introduction it was said that you condemned Islamic Jihad. 
Is that true, or did you condemn the exploitation of Islam and jihad? And please clarify the meaning of jihad. Yes, thank you. <coughs> yes, the question was, the question, do we condemn Islamic jihad is no. But we, do we uh, condemn <coughs> what is popularly seen as jihad? Yes. Uh, Islam, jihad, jihad, something in struggle. Jihad is in struggle. And the best struggle is the struggle that we make to, to achieve what God wants. Personally, and ourselves. God wants us to struggle to conquer the bad forces within our own life, personal life. The bad thoughts we have, the bad tendencies we have. That's the first person. And then the greatest sacrifice we can make as Muslims is to be willing to sacrifice our properties, our lives, even our lives, uh, to promote, uh, to achieve the end that God wants on earth. And the end that God wants on earth is not that any people dominate another people, not that any people progress at the expense of others. Uh, so that jihad is the jihad that we accept, that is our jihad. Uh, <clears throat> as for, as for uh, uh, the meaning of jihad, I think I've answered that question, part of the question. Uh, do we want jihad? Yes, we must continue to struggle. We believe that life is a continuous struggle and we have to be prepared always to struggle and sacrifice our all for the ends that God wants in our personal life and in society. How does the Nation of Islam regard the traditional Sunni-Shiite split controversy? Yes, I think we are a little bit more uh, tolerant of uh, uh, these divisions, and uh, we don't uh, tend to make a lot of fuss over these divisions. We believe that these are developments that uh, were not uh, determined by our religion, but determined by the politics and the interaction the sentiments, the feelings, and jealousies that developed between uh, different parties in the history of Islam. We believe that uh, most of it is uh, to be charged to politics, uh, politics, uh, desire for control, etc. Jealousy between uh, uh, brothers and sisters in Islam, jealousy between uh, nations in Islam. Um, we believe that eventually Shi'i and Sunni will be no issue. We may not see it in our generation, we may not see it in many generations, but one day we know that if we all stick, stay, believing in the Quran, firm believers in the Quran, in our religion, and followers of our Prophet, if we remain on that path, that eventually the issue for Shiaism and Sunni uh, will be gone. We tend, we, tend, we tend to not want to speak too much of ourselves as Sunni Muslims, but uh, uh, you know, this, uh, we believe that what the founder who conceived our nation of Islam, our organization under the arm of Elijah Muhammad, we believe that what he did was just put something together, and his only uh, real interest was to attract down and out blacks of America. That was his only real interest. To at least identify as Muslims and identify with Islam. We, we think that, that, was his, that, that that's what he was uh, really about. Uh, and, uh, but we know that his idea of God and his idea of uh, leadership in Islam resembles more Shiaism or Shiai, Shiai uh, teaching than it does the, the teaching of most Muslims who are Sunni, who are called Sunni. Um, but we ourselves, we tend to be more uh, comfortable identifying with those that are called Sunni and not those that are called Shiite. But I have, I know this sounds like something we've heard before, but some of my best friends are Shiites. <laughs> yes. What are the rights and responsibilities of the title Imam, and what are the steps necessary in your faith to achieve this position? 
to achieve the position of imam? Of imam. Yes. Uh, in our religion, there is no real clergy, there's no priesthood, and really there's no real clergy in Islam. In our religion, the people are responsible. The people are responsible for, elect, for selecting their leader or the imam to lead them in the prayer uh, based upon two qualifications. The first qualification is that he's a decent person. His character is good. And the second qualification is that he be above them in the knowledge of Islam. Above them. They think he's above them in the knowledge of Islam. However, the second qualification is, is not always the one that determines who will be the leader. For sometimes the people are more learned than their imam, but they think their imam has the best character and the best devotion to the religion, so they will select him to be their leader. Why do you believe that the increasing, that increasing numbers of violent acts, such as the bombing of the World Trade Center, are done in the name of Islam? Uh, well, Islam uh, is a big force. It's a very significant force. There are about one billion Muslims now, we're told. And Muslims uh, represent nations that uh, uh, I think uh, gives, well, well, the global picture. The global picture, when we look at Africa, 50% of Africa Muslims. Uh, we look at the Middle East, the population there, Indonesia, that big country. Uh, by the way, that was not converted by the sword. They were attracted to the character of the Islamic businessmen, and the character of the Islamic businessmen was so impressive to them that eventually the whole country of Indonesia became Muslim. And uh, I hope we have that. I hope we can get that character in our Islamic businessmen again. <laughs> um, yes, and in um, in Europe, Albania, and uh, several other Muslim communities in Asia. We are now learning that there are a significant number of Muslims in communist China, and we know of the Muslims in Russia. Uh, so Muslims are around the world, all around the world, and these uh, persons uh, who are reacting to their bad situations, uh, we have to sympathize with them, but not condone their un-Islamic behavior. When I say we have to sympathize with them, uh, when, when you put a person in a situation that they are fighting desperately just to exist day by day, then you have to sympathize with those persons. And uh, that's the situation that we have for some of the Palestinians uh, who, have, who lost their homes and their homeland. That's the situation for, that we have in Kashmir for Muslims who are being denied their rights there and in many other places. So when Muslims register the hurt and suffering of Muslims all over the world, and when that Muslim that registered that hurt is also being denied his life day after day, then we can understand the desperate, the desperate behavior of those individuals, but we cannot condone that kind of behavior. We have to condemn it and invite them to turn to their religion for support and for guidance and for peace. Following that same line of thought, would you please comment about the current situation in Bosnia, what you see as the future for Bosnia? Yes. Well, I'm not all uh, disappointed uh, totally. Uh, I'm proud of the interest that I see in the West, and especially in America, um, to get support to the people of Bosnia. Uh, at first, I thought it was only a case of uh, the Serbs uh, persecuting the Muslims. Uh, but as more information came out, we, we began to see the picture as being not so simple, it's, it's kind of complex. The picture is very difficult. It's a co complex situation there, and uh, political uh, uh, elements are there, and with religious, with religious interest. And I think that it's going to take time to work it out I just hope that our government, President uh, Bill Clinton, and uh, our government leaders and American society will, will not forget Bosnia and will do all that it can, all we can, to bring justice to that area. 
Might religious strife be lessened if all governments were secular and none controlled by a particular religion? Well, I can tell you this. There's no Muslim government controlled by Islam that I know of. I would be very comfortable with Muslim governments being under the control of Islam. Doesn't mean that I would accept the theocracy. I don't believe in a theocracy. I believe in, I love this kind of democracy we have here. But um, I think that all the good Christians in America would always want us to be under God. It's in the Constitution of these United States, or at least the introduction to the Constitution, that we be under God. Um, and I would think that we would always want religious conscience and religious interests uh, to be respected. So I, I wouldn't like to answer that question uh, with a yes or a no. I would just like to say we don't have religion yet where we want to see religion. Once we have it where we want to see it, all nations should be under God. Questions have come forward regarding Salman Rushdie. Let me combine them into one. Uh, what is your personal opinion on the death sentence placed upon him? And also, would you please talk uh, about your feelings regarding his visit with President Clinton recently? Yes. Um, well, <laughs> I thought that the death sentence on him was symbolic, though real for him, because there are Muslims who won't read it as symbolic, <laughs> um, to create a certain effect and to send out a message. And that is that Muslims love their religion very dearly and uh, we won't tolerate insults like uh, he's guilty of. But uh, according to our religion, anyone can differ with us in religion. Religion is not to be imposed upon anyone or forced upon anyone. Uh, God is too big for us to force people to serve him. Uh, the scriptures are too precious and too great for us to force those scriptures on anybody. So we are to tolerate people different with us in, in religion. But I think we are to condemn anybody who makes such an attack upon sacred matters and sacred concerns and, and um, uh, chief personalities in the religion. Uh, uh, no, I'm not really offended only by his uh, disrespect for Islam. I'm offended by his disrespect for the Queen of England, uh, you know. But uh, it seems that some of us will tolerate uh, someone throwing dirt or filth on our enemy uh, and us, as long as our enemy gets the worst part of it. <laughs> How does the Nation of Islam look upon uh, Louis Farrakhan, Jesse Jackson, and Dr. Jeffries? Well, we look upon them as leaders uh, who uh, play music uh, to, to black folks. And uh, and sometimes their music cause black people to do an indecent dance. Please comment on the accuracy of the portrayal of your father in the film Malcolm X. Yes, I'm, let me first say that I think that it was a good film when it comes to Hollywood. Hollywood film, good film. But accuracy, no. Um, I saw a resemblance uh, to my father. The, the actor did a very great job. I know him very well. I can't think of his name right now. Uh, Freeman, yes. Yes, uh, he did a very good job of capturing the, uh, I would say, the humble, the humble posture of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the seriousness of, that, of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Uh, but uh, that's only a small part of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad had a humorous side uh, and he had a lively side, lively side, he had an aggressive side to him, and much of that was missing. So I just think a small, small, little small facet of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was projected 
And when it comes to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad as a teacher of Malcolm, then it didn't do with, uh, credit to Honorable Elijah Muhammad, because Honorable Elijah Muhammad uh, didn't only attract Malcolm uh, to uh, his mission, or to Malcolm's own mission. Um, Honorable Elijah Muhammad gave Malcolm a lot of good education, a lot of good moral teaching, a lot of good wisdom, and I think much of that was missing in the film. America comes from a tradition of uh, Judeo-Christian uh, ethic, and we seem to have a difficult time uh, understanding uh, how to handle situations in the Middle East with Islamic lands. What would you uh, suggest to the government of the United States as to how to deal with Islamic nations? Yes. Um, I think uh, the, the, the government of the United States is in much better situation now to deal with the heavy questions and issues uh, that, that, uh, that it has to deal with regarding the situation in the Middle East. Uh, but I would just say that the government need to do more. Uh, I would say un bias, unprejudiced uh, inquiry or study uh, into the life, and nature, nature and life of the Muslim societies, not just in the Middle East, but the Muslim society. Get to know what, what motivates us, what, uh, turns, what turns our life on in our religion, uh, what values uh, uh, hold up our life um, and uh, get, uh, know better the history of the people that they are dealing with directly. How did they come to be in that situation they're in? Uh, were they always in that situation? No. The Muslims that I meet from the area tell me that at one time before the, uh, the um, uh, World War II, uh, they were enjoying good uh, atmosphere for themselves with their neighbors, the Jews of that area. Um, but not only that, I think uh, we should now even accept to help the parties see better. I think if our government studies the life of the people there, that they will be able to make a contribution uh, to even the solutions that those people may think are best for them. I'm, uh, I'll, be, I'll, be, I'll be very plain. The Palestinian leadership, they may see solutions, and these solutions may not all be the right solutions. The government of Israel also may be in the same situation. Uh, if our government leaders who are not directly involved, sometimes outsiders, if they're sincere, they can make real contribution to a, to, a, to, a, to, a, to a settlement, to a peaceful and acceptable settlement. settlement. So I think we should also be willing to put ourselves in that position to say that maybe if we understand them better, we can help them with their own solutions, not just listen to their solutions, but help them with their own solutions. I don't know if that's being done or not, but that's what I would advise. Before Mrs. Glazer comes back to close the program, we're going to have time for this one last question. Again, it's an extension of some of your previous remarks. Please give specific examples of how Muslims can be of greater value to American society. Yes, yes. Well, I've experienced it, so I can tell, it, tell you. Um, first thing you have to do is whether you like America or not, except that you're here and you're not going to another place. And I know you're not, because I don't see you making any plans to. So we are here. We're not going anywhere else. You have to, you have to regard the place that you are living in, and where you're having your children, and where you're going to leave your children, because all of us are going to die, and we're going to leave our children here. You have to regard that place as your place, no matter how bad it is. 
And to me, it's not bad. It's not bad. It's, it's much more good than it is bad. Uh, but if you think it's not, you think it's more bad than it is good, still, you have to live here and you have to regard this place as your own. That's the first step. Regard this place as your own because you're here and you're going to leave your children here. Regard it as your own. Once you do that, then things happen for you psychologically to work out all the other problems. Mohammed, thank you for your deeply felt message of peace and reconciliation. Thank you, Diane Glazer. Thank you very much. This has now, been a special honor. Especially for me. But the World Affairs Council wants you to remember that you were here. Thank you. I will never forget it. <laughs> well, we want to give you... This is a book. I'll tell you what it's about. It's a bird's eye view of Los Angeles. You are going to leave here, but these people, they're in this place, as you said. Yes. Yeah. And I want you to remember them, too, and to remember Thank us. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you so very mm -hmm. much. The meeting is adjourned. This event was held recently by the Los Angeles World Affairs Council, a nonprofit group entirely supported by its 9,000 members. More than 40 leading world figures in foreign policy, business, and economics address this group each year. The previous speaker, Wallace D. Mohammed, is the Muslim American spokesman for a group known as Human Salvation. He's the son of the late Elijah Mohammed former leader of the Nation of Islam. Next on